are urgently calling on all county school systems to return to hybrid uh, in-person instruction no later than March 1, if not sooner. I'm seeing every day children where last year were honor students are now failing classes. Online learning has been awful so far. Virtual learning does not adequately provide the academic, social, and emotional growth our students need. The data from schools suggest that if there's very little transmission that is happening within the schools, especially when there's masking and distancing occurring. All we are are data points. Folks are being denied ADA accommodations. We actually have uh, teachers that are taking leave. Doesn't matter what your health condition is, come back to work. We don't think it's safe. Teachers want to be back with their students under the safe condition. It would be to have our educators finish their doses of the vaccine before they go back into schools. I know people are scared. This is a scary time. This is a Fox 45 Town Hall, your voice, your future. And good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Bubala. Education during the COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the most difficult and contentious problems in Maryland and across the nation, really. While some schools quickly return to some form of in-person learning, most larger school districts in the Baltimore area have stuck with distance learning. And the decisions about schools have led to intense debate among parents, students, teachers, administrators, and our public officials. Joining us tonight for our discussion on education during the pandemic are Dr. Scott Krugman, Vice Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at Sinai Hospital, Chris Papps of Fox 45's Project Baltimore team, Dr. Terry Sawyer, Senior Vice President at Loyola University, State Delegate Kathy Shalega representing Hartford and Baltimore counties, and Dr. Chow Wu, Chairman of the Howard County Board of Education. We want to thank you all for being part of this virtual town hall. Dr. Krubin, we're going to start with you. First, let's listen to what Governor Hogan said earlier this month about the return to school. There can no longer be any debate at all. Uh, it is abundantly clear that the toll of keeping students out of school far exceeds any potential risk of having uh, students in school where they belong. Dr. Krugman, the governor says there can no longer be debate over whether to return to in-person learning. Do you agree with him? As long as the guidelines that have been set out by the CDC, <coughs> excuse me, and the American Academy of Pediatrics are being followed, I think it's very fair to say that kids can safely return to school and not be vectors of transmission amongst each other and towards teachers. Uh, there have been kids back in classrooms across the country in a variety of different locales, and we have not seen significant outbreaks, and there is some evidence that the rate of transmission is actually far lower than what happens in the community, and the teachers and students who are getting sick are getting sick at events outside of school, not inside of school. Yeah, that's sort of what I was going to ask. What have we learned over the past year about children and the spread of COVID? Yeah, a few things. So one, we know kids can get sick. Kids can get COVID. Um, they can get very seriously ill. And we've had deaths in Maryland and across the country. Uh, th this week, we reported our three, three millionth case of COVID in children. Um, and that's a lot, right? That being said, the risk of serious illness and death in children is significantly lower than it is in adults. We also know that children are not the big super spreaders that they are with things like the common cold or influenza, where they spread that throughout the entire school to everybody and everyone gets sick. Um, COVID does not spread as easily from kids. They have a lower amount of transmission, especially the younger they are. Uh, teenagers are a different story. They're much more like adults. But uh, the, if proper precautions like mask wearing, distancing, hand washing, cleaning, and ventilation are put into place, the risk of transmission is quite low. And let's talk about the risk of children being out of school. I know many children are struggling with distance learning, and there are many struggling with mental health issues being out of school. How big of a problem is it? So there, there is clearly a few small subset of kids who are doing much better on distance learning. Those are kids who have serious anxiety issues and don't do well in the school environment, and that's been great for them. But the vast majority of kids who 
thrive on social environments, thrive working in structured environments where they have routine wake up times, days, after school activities, regular bedtimes, all those things have kind of gone out the window. What we're seeing is a lot of kids with a lot of sleep problems. They can't get to sleep till midnight, one, two in the morning. They're having trouble waking up for online classes. The online classes aren't stimulating them and they're falling behind. And we have a lot of kids who are, are struggling with that. In addition to that, you throw in stresses and challenges in the family with trying to deal with a pandemic with environmental uncertainty or economic uncertainty. That adds stress to kids as well. And we have seen a large number of kids with mental health issues, and it appears that there's some increase in emergency room visits for mental health issues. But we need to be supporting our kids no matter what environment they're in, whether they're at home or school, we need to provide the resources they need to have adequate mental health services, treatment, and we lack that as well. It's very, not easy in the state of Maryland to get hooked up with a therapist and to um, have a, um, to have people um, get, get the treatment that they need. All right, thank you, Dr. Krugman. Doc, uh, Delegate Shalega, let's move on to you. Let's listen to what a teacher's union representative said earlier this month, and we'll talk about it on the other side. I'm not saying the CDC is incorrect. I mean, low risk does not mean no risk. Staff are finished sacrificing everything for an employer who has no respect for their lives or their work. All right, the teachers union has consistently pushed for greater measures to ensure the safety of teachers and students before a return to in-person learning. Delegate Shalega, do you, do you understand and empathize why they're worried? Of course, I understand as a former teacher uh, with a degree in education, elementary ed from Towson University and a family full of teachers, I absolutely empathize with their concerns about going back to school. But we've heard from Dr. Krugman that kids can go back to be safe, to be healthy. We can look at what they're doing in other states, Florida, Texas, Arkansas, Iowa, They've all had in-person learning consistently since September. We have lots of non-public schools right here in Maryland that have been open full-time for in-person learning, and they've done well. So I think we can, I know, I know that we can get schools open for in-person learning. Listen, if I was going to be grading the school, teach, school system today on how they are doing, I would give them a D minus. We're expecting our educators to teach our kids problem solving. They have done a terrible job at solving this problem. They have been out of school for almost an entire year. We know there are teachers that are ready to get back in the classroom. And we know there are kids that are ready to get back in the classroom. We should match them up. I know there are teachers that for health and safety reasons probably should be virtually teaching as well as kids for the same reason. Why can't the school system figure this out? Other states are doing it. It's just not okay. Yeah, the Catholic schools in Baltimore have done a great job. They could definitely be a, a prototype for some of the other school districts. We're going to move on to Terry Sawyer from Loyola University. Terry, we're going to listen to what the health officer in Carroll County said earlier this month and then talk about it. I think if you start talking about bringing the full student body back, that's going to get problematic. I just don't know how you're going to fit um, fit the students in the classroom and, it, and at least keep some uh, reasonable amount of, of, of social distancing. Terry, you've overseen the reopening efforts at Loyola University as you welcome back students to campus, but you just heard a county health officer express doubts about bringing students back safely. I know it's different college uh, campus versus a, a school campus, elementary or high school. How have you been able to do it? And are there lessons that they can learn from, from colleges? Yeah, the health officer is correct when he points out that it is difficult and it required significant investment on the part of the university. We had to add over a dozen temporary classrooms on an athletic field. We had to have a gigantic tent, looks like Barnum and Bailey Circus over here at Loyola, that we, uh, we use for our dining to reduce density. We leased um, a number of, uh, of residential units off of our campus to reduce density on campus. Significant undertaking and a significant financial investment was required to be able to bring students back safely because it's essential that you do reduce density, 
that you uh, put public health measures in place that have to be there. Uh, and then you layer on top of that all the testing that you have to do. We've just started the semester and we're already at 5,000 tests. Uh, so it is an undertaking if, in fact, you want to do it and do it safely. What are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing, even with all of those efforts that you're taking? You know, we've been very fortunate in that of those 5,000 tests, we've had only 69 positives back. Um, because of the way we're situated and we're so largely residential, unlike a K-12 through situation, we can really create a bubble, if you will, where we started with baseline testing, making sure that all the students as they moved in were uh, negative, that they were positive, they went into isolation housing and we monitored them very closely. Um, you know, the challenge is, is, is in part compliance. I mean, these are 18 to 22 year olds primarily. And, um, uh, you know, getting them to understand that it takes a village and a lot of uh, um, unnatural behavior on their part. They wanna hug each other when they see each other. They wanna uh, talk to their professors up close. But we're seeing really good results from our students and understanding that they have to sacrifice and that this hopefully will be a temporary condition that they currently have to endure. There's also a little bit of herd immunity. I have two college students and they both have had COVID and most of their friends have too. So it's, it's interesting. Well, Chris mm -hmm. Papps from Fox 45 Project Baltimore. We're gonna move on to you. Let's listen to what city school superintendent, Dr. Sonia Santalisa said earlier this year and then what a city school teacher told you. We know there are groups of young people who desperately need support they can only receive in person. The second, we have growing numbers of our families who want this in-person option. And third, we've proven we can do this safely. And the cases will increase. This is basic science. It's a, it's a numbers game. We know that the contagious rate will increase and that will lead to death. In your view, mm -hmm. when would it be responsible to go back to in-person learning? If COVID-19 has taught us nothing else over the last year is that it has the timeline. We cannot drive the timeline. Chris, that teacher struck a chord with a lot of people um, a lot of teachers uh, were thankful that he came out and spoke. We want to do mention, Chris, that we did invite the, the teachers union to be part of this uh, town hall and they declined. Tell us a little bit more about the debate over the return to in-person learning, specifically in Baltimore City Schools. Well, there's a lot of things to consider here when looking at this. So Dr. Sonia Santelis, as the CEO of City Schools, said that the course failure rate for their students from K through 12 has nearly doubled this year from last year. Now, Baltimore City Schools is already one of the lowest performing school systems in the country, third lowest, according to some federal statistics from the National Association of Educational Progress. And think about that, now double the number of students have been failing as opposed to last year. So Dr. Santelisis is saying that these students, we need to get them in the class now before double becomes triple, before our graduation rates plummet to even lower than what they are now, before more kids are failing out of the school system and dropping out of the school system. And I did speak to the teacher about that and I asked him and he said yes. He goes, he has a large number of students that are failing. He told me only about 40% of his kids log on every day, which means 60% of his students are not logging on. Where are these kids? What are they gonna do? This has now been a year. How are these kids gonna catch up? And the answer is, they're likely not. You can't lose an entire year and then expect kids to catch up and be where kids are now who have been on those virtual learning calls or the kids in southern Pennsylvania that are back in school, the kids in Carroll County that are back in school, the kids that are in the private schools in the area that are back in school. These kids are learning. They're not falling behind. And I think that uh, the achievement gap here is something that we're going to be watching very closely. It's something that politicians like to talk about all the time when talking about school funding and schools themselves. The differences in the different groups of kids as part, as in terms of their educational progress. That ch achievement gap, when we start looking at test scores that are coming back, start looking at graduation rates, start looking at the number of kids that are failing, getting promoted, uh, falling back. It's, it's going to be dire. And Dr. Santelisis has already said that. And 
her original date to go back has now been pushed. And is it going to get pushed again? It might. So this is something that is not going to go away. No, it is serious. A major ripple effect of the pandemic. You also reported on a number of Maryland families who took their children out of public schools to put them in private schools, sort of when the distance learning really took hold. Here's what one Baltimore County mom had to say to you. We tried very hard. We wanted to continue to use our public school system. It's horrible. It's horrible to have to make this decision. All right, Chris, how has that worked out for that family? Oh, they're gone. So they're yeah. gone and they're not going back into the public school system. And you have seen this with, we, we did a story a couple weeks ago, Mary, about 10,000 kids in the school systems just in the, the Baltimore region have left public school. Now that was also a number that was taken on September 30th. So since then, hundreds if not thousands of more kids have also left the school system and we know this because we have spoken to a few of them but it's just one more point that i want to make here mary if i if i can just have 30 more seconds if you look at a school system like baltimore city those schools are not just places where kids go to get educated they're places where kids go to get dental care it's where they go to get vision care it's where they go to get overall health care it's where they eat in a city like Baltimore that has 300 to 350 murders a year, it's where kids go who don't have parents to have counseling and to be around adults. We've interviewed these kids. We've interviewed the kids whose parents have been murdered and their schools were the places that they went to for support. We're working on interviewing kids who no longer have dental care, who no longer have vision care. It's not just that they're failing. It's not just that they're falling behind. And this is a, this is in a city like Baltimore. It's all these other things. This this is it's a much bigger issue, Mary, than than just kids going to school to learn or being at home virtual learning. The schools have become the centerpieces in many of these kids' lives for many of the things that a lot of us take for granted. And by the teachers not going back into a place like Baltimore City, the, the damage is it's really hard to even calculate and we've spoken to an fbi agent a former fbi agent who said they're already planning for an increase in crime because all the kids that are dropping out and all the kids that are failing yeah, so i i understand i, mean, I was if a, we think when kids go back to school it's going to be over it's not it's not i was a volunteer in a baltimore city school before the pandemic it is where kids also got a lot of love it was their support system so i hear you chris thank you for for that point we want to pivot back to Dr. Krugman talking a little bit about vaccinating children. We're starting to hear more about it. There are some clinical trials underway. Will that be sort of a game changer for schools? And I'm really thinking that it probably wouldn't even happen till this fall. Maybe it depends on how fast we get this vaccine to the rest of the population. Yeah, I think we can't rely on vaccination for kids to go back to school. Uh, we can hope for more and more teachers in the next month or two to get vaccinated, and that might help protect them. But we are a long way away from kids getting vaccines. We're just starting the trials now. Uh, it, maybe this fall we'll start vaccinating some kids, at least in the you know teenage or 12 and up range. Um, but I think we have at least a year till COVID vaccine becomes part of a routine like flu vaccine for kids every year. And I don't, we don't even know how long the vaccines will last in kids. There's just a lot of unknowns. So I think we need to be prepared to create safe environments for kids to succeed in school for at least the next couple of years, because we're not going to be at a point where every kid's going to be vaccinated and we can just let our guard down. And I want to ask really quickly for you, you talk about a safe environment for a child and a teacher. Is that masks and, and socially distanced desks six feet apart in a classroom and proper ventilation? I think yeah, that's I, why teachers are worried that, for, and especially in Baltimore City schools, which they can't even get drinking fountains to work, that teachers don't feel like the proper ventilation and all the mitigation efforts that I see here at a private company where I work, we've been here since March, that they are doing, teachers feel like that wouldn't happen in, in some of the schools. Well, there's no reason it shouldn't happen. Right. We should be putting investments into our school infrastructure. It, we, we have not prioritized our children yet in this pandemic. We've prioritized a lot of different things and we've been very good about 
helping support businesses, and there has been some money going to schools, but what, what are they... We know what needs to be done. We need to put ventilation in. We need to uh, do at least three feet, if possible, six feet distancing. Put in some plexiglass, wear masks. Kids are actually doing a very good job all around this country and here in Maryland wearing masks. They're actually better than a lot of the adults who go to the grocery store. So I, I think kids can do it and we can create that environment. But I just haven't seen the, the, the push, the impetus to do this. And like uh, Delegate Talasia said, We've known about this for a long time. We've known about this from the summer, what we need to do. A lot of us were kind of yelling and screaming, like, let's get the facilities upgraded. Let's get things positioned so we can do this. And it's just been very slow movement. And it's been very frustrating because the kids really do need to go back to school that's, safely. That's right. And other big public school systems across the country are doing it. And they could provide blueprints of how to do it. Delegate Shalega, some say the school debate has revealed the power and in influence of the teachers union. Do you see that changing anytime soon? You know, I wish that I saw it changing, but I do not. The teachers union PAC gave over $2 million in the last election cycle to get people elected. Um, all of that, uh, probably 90% of it went to Democrats. So I'm not surprised that they won't stand up to the teachers union. Um, and they keep moving the goalpost. They, you know, they, when there's a goalpost reach, they're like, oh, no, no, we, we now want kids to get vaccinated. Well, Dr. Krugman just told you that's, that's not here yet. Our schools have more money today than they have ever had. Maryland public schools are at the highest funding rate in the history of our state. Each school has received about $140,000 beyond this highest funding rate in the history of our state. So the money is there, but the plans are not. And, you know, this achievement gap that Chris Papps talked about is just heart-wrenching. When we think about the special needs kids who are being left behind, you know, those early years between two and five, those are critical years to get our special needs kids services. Our early learners, I mean, you learn how to read when you're young and they're missing out. When you can read to learn, it's one thing, but you can't learn to read on a, on a computer, on an iPad. This just is not serving our early learners. So, you know, the money's there. The planning is not there. The teacher's union is moving the goalposts, but parents are calling me continually. Almost every day I get a call from a parent. Parents who, uh, one of them have had to quit their job to be home to homeschool their kids. Um, it's just heartbreaking to see this. And they're saying to me, Kathy, we're uh, expecting people to work in Target. We go to Walmart, we go to all these big box stores and those workers are essential and they're going to work. Why aren't the teachers going to work? Why can't we find a way to get our kids in-person learning? It's very frustrating. Well, the push is on from the governor, from you, and from even President Biden. They want uh, kids to go back to the classroom. Dr. Chao Wu is the chairman of the Howard County School Board. He's joining us now. Dr. Wu, I'd like to ask you how worried about a permanent loss of enrollment and the loss of funding as the result of this extended distance learning. How worried are you about that for your school district? Thank you, I really appreciate you having me here. And our school system definitely is worried about the loss of learning during the last this pandemic. However, our school is working really hard to bring the instructions and even we're moving forward with our hybrid plan, which we're starting March 1st, to really bring both in person and the remote learning to our students. And Dr. Wu, despite CDC guidance saying it is safe, there is still obviously a high level of anxiety on the part of teachers about returning to in-person learning. Let's listen to one teacher who spoke at a recent school board meeting. My anxiety is through the roof. And I don't know if I can get some of that. Dr. Wu, what can you say to teachers like that one as chairman of the Howard County School Board? Uh, in, that teacher was in tears. Sure, I totally understand the difficulty we're facing. And uh, at the same time, we're looking at the case rate is going down. And for example, as among the, 
of the, the, this Monday, February 15th, the seven-day confirmed case average is going down. It's now 13.38 per 100,000 residents, which is down approximately 60% from just one month ago. And the seven-day uh, seven average positivity rate is around 7. Point, as 3.78 percent is pretty low, and we have around 46 percent of our staff have received the vaccine and or scheduled to receive their vaccine. At the same time, we we really try to provide a safe uh, instruction environment in the school system with the hybrid model. We can we are able to really get the social distance working. At the same time, we provide sufficient PPE and other preparation precaution in the school system make sure we really are prepared to have our students and uh, teachers come back in the classroom and uh, safely and they can work in the safe environment all right dr wu thank you i want to uh, sort of end with with terry sawyer you are uh, with students around students socially distanced if you could what has it been like to have students back on campus and um, sort of set us off on a positive tone here for some of the school districts that will have kids back in schools uh, in, in March. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, we were virtual in the fall semester and it was just terrible to be here. Everything looked perfect, except there were no students and no faculty here. And to bring them back has just been wonderful. And I empathize with all the angst on both sides of this, of this argument. But for us, it's really been a joy. And as hard as this bit has been, when we think about what we want for our students, we want them to be brave, we want them to be resilient, we want them to be resourceful, creative, and all of those things have come to bear through this really unfortunate situation for everyone. But this will be something that this generation remembers for the rest of their lives. Uh, and we feel that we here have met the moment um, and not without a lot of effort and a lot of consternation to get there, but it's really great uh, to have our students back here. All right, and I think parents appreciate it as well as long as the mitigation efforts are in there and everybody is following the rules as best they can. Dr. Krugman, tell us um, what you think is, is the biggest benefit for students heading back to the class. I, I think it's, it gets back to structure. Kids thrive on routines, on consistency, on knowing what's going to happen in their lives, and school provides a huge anchor for those kids to have regular bedtimes, regular wake-up times, after-school activities, interactions, and I, I, it's just really, really important to get that, and it's been really hard for parents who are trying to balance work sometimes at home and kids and kids who are in school and kids who aren't in school it's just been very difficult for parents and parents need a break kids need structure and everyone i think a lot of the teachers want the kids back i think they're they're doing a great job with the resources they have to do online learning but it isn't the same and especially for the youngest kids they really need the hands-on experience to to really get those developmental skills that they need to thrive. Yes, let's get more vaccine for more teachers as well. That would be helpful. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight's town hall. We would like to thank our panelists for their time, their expertise and their thoughts. It was really valuable time. And we'd like to thank you for joining us in this really timely and val valuable conversation as kids head back to the classroom next month. Thanks for joining us. Good night.